I was lamenting BYU's quarterback situation on our Monday show, but I saw something Monday afternoon during BYU football practice to give me some hope for BYU's offense in 2024. I'll explain ahead on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Appreciate all of you who are everydayers with us right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. This is your original daily podcast focused on all things BYU sports. We are brought to you today by our friends over at Nissan. Are you kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Ever wonder what the next adventure could be right around the corner for you? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at Nissan. USA.com. All right, let's dive right in on today's show. Day three of BYU spring camp is in the books. Uh, we had about a 25-ish minute uh, media observation window to be out there inside the indoor practice facility for BYU. And I, I thought overall BYU had a pretty solid day. Now the pads were on for the first time for BYU and that completely changes the d- dynamic for BYU. But I mentioned there was one thing that gives me some hope for BYU's offense that I saw on Monday. And that is I think BYU's got a nice stable of running backs. Now, let me be very clear about this. It's a 25-minute window. It's not very long of a, what, it's usually two-hour practice. But what I saw from LJ Martin, Pokeawa Haunga, as well as Enoch Nawahine, I thought BYU had a pretty good day running the football, particularly behind the first string offensive line. Is it the first string offensive line I expect to have come August? No, I do not expect it to be the the five guys that lined up for BYU along that offensive front uh, from left to right. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was Caleb Etienne at left tackle. Then you had Waylon Lapuaho back at his uh, right, left guard spot. Connor Pay reprising his role as BYU's uh, man in the middle at uh, center. And then you had Sonny Moccasini as well as Jake Eichhorn on the right side of BYU's offensive line that made up the first string offensive line yesterday for my observation. And what I liked about it was that offensive line actually had some success against what is a revamped BYU defensive line that against other offensive lines during the observation window was very, very good. I'm not saying that BYU's D-line struggle by any means. They actually were very, very talented and had a good day. But what I saw from LJ Martin in particular, he is showing the burst that he had as a freshman last year, but he is 20-ish pounds heavier. Uh, they listed him last year at six foot two, 205 pounds. And yeah, he was a freshman who was needed to pack on some weight. And you can tell just watching him walk off the field today that that young man has hit the weight room hard and he is bulked up. Yeah, maybe he's not the 225 pounds that BYU's listed there, but he's easily 215 if not 220 pounds, and he carries his weight well, carries his weight well. And the best part is, is the burst that he had last. Remember when he had that big touchdown run against Arkansas, just showing the ability to accelerate through holes. He has still got that in, in those uh, short yardage situations and the ability to get downfield. Now, I also mentioned uh, Pokeawa Hunga, uh, Enoch Nawahine. I cannot discount also that Miles Davis had a very, very solid day. He took a speed option. A run to the house is like a 50 yard run uh, that he scored on for BYU. So the running back position for BYU showed well on day three. And Aaron Roderick said it after practice the BYU's goal, their whole goal, maybe not the whole goal, but the main goal of spring camp for this BYU offense is to relearn or rediscover the ability to run the ball down opposing defense's throat. Now, We are still months away from the season actually getting underway and BYU seeing anybody but themselves when it comes to practice situations. But I liked what I saw from BYU's running backs, and it gives me some hope that even if the quarterback play is not necessarily at the same level it has been for BYU, think about it. BYU is going to have a nice run here of three guys who are going to be on NFL rosters next year, uh, considering that uh, that Keaton Slovis very much looks the part that he may be drafted and or a, a signed undrafted free agent that could latch on with an NFL team. So they've had three straight NFL quarterbacks and maybe they're not going to necessarily have that same level of quarterback play. Maybe they do. Maybe I'm completely wrong. And I'm, I'm happily 
really uh, going to eat crow if that is the truth, that they do have an elite quarterback that emerges. But I think that the running game for BYU, there is a new mindset. I'm, and this could all be smoke and mirrors. It could be us uh, being shown one thing by BYU and the whole adage, uh, shame on me, uh, fool me once, shame on me, sh- fool me twice, shame on you. That whole uh, adage could hold true for BYU. But I like the mentality I saw from BYU and those running backs. And we'll see if it ultimately comes out that they are as good as advertised. But from what I saw from my uh, vantage point, I was very intrigued by BYU's running backs. Now, other guys who stood out on day three include Danny Saili. Folks, that is a very very large man on the defensive front for BYU. Uh, they list him at six foot three, 360 pounds, but he is a nimble, nimble man for that size. I know that's an oxymoron, but he had a whistle sack in Gary Bohannon uh, where he burst through the second string offensive line and uh, got a hand on Bohannon before they blew it dead or got close to getting a hand on him. And that's a whistle sack. He is showing the ability to really be a very, very capable run stopper. But at the same time, like I said, be able to get in the backfield and make some plays. And Jay Hill, uh, when I asked him about about that after practice, you can go and listen to the audio wherever you get your podcast. You can just search out uh, BYU Spring Camp company uh, that I work for my day job. But uh, the thing is that Danny Saili is showing some really, really nice ability for BYU right now. And that's a positive that you have a guy come in of his caliber and you're expecting him to make an impact right away. And that's exactly what he has done. I also continue to be intrigued by what Isaiah Glasker is putting out there on the field. He's just, just a smooth ass backer for BYU. I am hoping and praying that he stays healthy this year because I think he could be an impact player for BYU at linebacker. And considering that Ben Bywater's set to reprise his role this fall, he's going to sit out this spring due to that shoulder injury that he had surgery on. But him, uh, Jack Kelly, Isaiah Glasker, Ace Kafusi, uh, on down the list of BYU's linebackers, they got a good uh, group of guys at that linebacker spot. And if they are capable of continuing to make plays each day and kind of, as they like to say all the time, stack days on top of one another, that could be a very, very positive thing for the Cougars. Now, with regards to the quarterback play overall, day three, I thought it was fairly lackluster. No, uh, nece- no necessarily one guy or the other standing out amongst the two contenders for the starting position in Gary Bohannon and Jake Retzloff. JoJo Phillips probably had the highlight catch of the day on a deep ball that during the media observation window, I should say. During the media observation window, he uh, adjusted to a very, very uh, well-thrown ball to the sideline of Jake Retzloff. JoJo Phillips uh, kind of adjusted. He kind of caught it over his uh, outside shoulder and hauled it in for an incredible catch. Uh, Jojo Phillips is a name to pay attention to. Aaron Roderick said that he thinks he's capable of contributing this year, and that adds to an already uh, capable group of wide receivers if Jojo Phillips is capable of getting into the mix there. He's got the size that anybody outside of Chase Roberts doesn't really have at wide receiver for BYU. He's all a six foot four, six foot five, 200 plus pounds, and just plays a very, very smooth style of football. And that's one thing I think that Jojo Phillips brings is he's got that basketball mentality. Remember he played at Sierra Canyon high school, where LeBron uh, James Jr., or as most of you know, and Bronny played, and he played basketball in addition to football, and BYU is very excited to have him playing for their football program, and I'm liking what I'm seeing early on from him, so he's a name to kind of file away as a guy down the road uh, to keep an eye on, and then also, the the punter position is going to be an interesting one. We got in there as media core, and they were doing uh, punt drills, allowing gunners to get downfield and kind of practice what they're doing, but we got two guys contending uh, to start in place of Ryan Rico, who's on his way to the NFL. Uh, his brother Landon Rico is more of that kind of straightforward uh, two-step and uh, boot at punter. And then you have Sam Vanderhaar, who we had on this podcast when he signed with BYU, who is the Aussie rules two-footed uh, style where he can roll out and kind of do that backspin uh, type uh, placement kick on opposing uh, return men. But both of them showed us uh, some things. Uh, Landon Rico probably had the best kick of the day because any of you who have been inside the indoor practice facility at BYU know how tall it is in there. And it's hard to think about uh, hitting the rafters inside that building. Well, Landon Rico did exactly that. He just absolutely hit a, a just a rocket shot of a punt, and it was traveling up, 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 and then just ricocheted off the rafters. And it was like, wow, 
That was impressive stuff. Does he have the same leg as his brother? Well, if that if he can continue to kick balls like that, maybe he will do that. But uh, just kind of funny to see that because you do typically don't see anybody. I mean, anybody in the years I've been going to BYU football practices, I very rarely have seen punters hit the rafters of BYU's indoor practice facility. But Landon Rico can add his name to that uh, pretty short list of guys who have accomplished that feat. So there you go. It's coming to the sights and sounds uh, from BYU uh, Spring Camp Day 3. Now, I will also say that Ronnie, Ron McBride or Ronnie Mack, as some people know him, was out there at practice. And also the Fanga family was in attendance for BYU. Now, Ray was a standout offensive lineman for BYU, spent time in the NFL with the Miami Dolphins. He has got a son. I think it's it's Toa is his first name, Toa Fanga. He's an eighth grader going into ninth grade. So he's a freshman this year. He's going to be playing at Harriman High School. But folks, Toa Fanga is just a chip off the old block. Any of you who have seen Ray play uh, for BYU or have seen Ray uh, just out and about know that he is one very large and very agile ath athletic man at offensive line and was that for BYU and in the NFL. Well, Toa is on his way. He may be as tall as his dad is already. And as I said, he's like, 14, 15 years old, and he announced uh, shortly after practice ended, he had an, he had an offer extended to him uh, by BYU. It sounded like the in the meeting was Kalani Sitake, Sione Pua, as well as TJ Woods. So congratulations to the Fanga family, and here's hoping that Toa, uh, class of 2028, considering how far down the road that is, Hopefully uh, soon uh, down the road, uh, he will be inking his national letter of intent to continue on the Fanga family legacy in Provo. But cool to see that. Uh, there are other programs like Utah, Oregon State, and I believe there's one other program I remember off the top of my head that have offered a tour uh, recently. It might have been Cal, but uh, really cool to see that. But uh, that's kind of the sights and sounds who was there for BYU and who was kind of milling around after practice wrapped up. Coming up next, I had a great chat after practice with Micah Harper. Now, Micah Harper is a guy that had a fantastic 2022 campaign, and the hope was in 2023 he was going to come into his own. He was going to be one of the studs for BYU's defense under Jay Hill's direction. Uh, he had proven that he was a, a playmaker at safety for BYU. We had that all torn away from him due to a season-ending injury. Well, he is back. Uh, he is working out with BYU in spring camp. It's his second uh, knee injury he's endured during his time at BYU. How are things different now versus what they were back in 2020 uh, when he ultimately uh, suffered that first knee injury and cost him the 2021 season? Well, you'll hear from him next right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Now, FanDuel has been with us for months, if not years now. The best part is they want to help you guys get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers, you can get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet uh, of any winning $5 bet. So you bet 5 bucks, it wins. You get $150 to play with, with from our friends over at FanDuel. Think about it. It's really simple. It's a very uh, low risk, potential high reward option for you guys. And the best part is you can do it on NBA, college basketball, NHL, no matter what the sport you're into or you're, what you're watching right now, do you want to enhance your viewing uh, pleasure of? You can do it with our friends at FanDuel. You can you know, use quick bets, live same game parlays. They also have exclusive prop bets available only from FanDuel in their easy to use app. The best part about the app is it's like two tabs. You place the bet and you're on your way. And then you can see if you can cash in later. But once again, a $5 bet wins you 150 bucks if it wins for your very first time. So take advantage of it today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot today. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. It's all courtesy of your friends over at FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at Utah Community Credit Union. Here's some exciting news. UCCU has just elevated their checking accounts by enhancing them with more benefits, more savings, and more online protections than ever before. And I mean a lot more. Paired with the most advanced and comprehensive mobile banking tools, elevated checking is a must-have financial product packed with lifestyle security and financial benefits for you, the consumer. The lifestyle benefits include uh, cell phone protection, roadside assistance, telehealth with 24-7 access to licensed health professionals with zero copay. Think about that. And exclusive savings on travel, shopping, and dining, my friends. The best part is elevated checking is free when you do any one of the following. Use your credit or debit card 15 times a month, or uh, 15 times or more a month. Uh, make a monthly direct deposit of $500 or more, or maintain an average daily balance of $1,500. Otherwise, UCCU elevated checking is just $6 a month. To take advantage of all the offers they have available to you guys, visit uccu.com to open an elevated checking account online or stop by any branch to open that account in person. It's all courtesy of friends over at UCCU. Love where you bank. 
Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. By the way, if you guys wanted to get up to the minute updates from practice yesterday, uh, if you were a member of our Locked On Cougars insiders groups, I was sending you texts in live time as I'm watching BYU practice play out. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of our Locked On Cougars insider group, I hit the link in our show notes. 14 day free trial, five dollars a month after that. And like I said, it's it's live updates. We're having a live chats uh, with y'all uh, during games, during BYU basketball games. It's actually, been a really really fun way to interact with you out there in Cougar Nation. So if you want to be a part of it, want to be the first to know what I'm uh, seeing and or hearing about BYU sports, join a Locked On Cougars Insider Group and do it today. Uh, it's a great way, as I mentioned, to support the podcast, but also at the same time, uh, foster an even deeper connection uh, with all of us out there in BYU's fan base. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about BYU in the defensive secondary. And let's do it with a guy that I think is poised to make some noise. Pardon the pun and the, and the rhyme there. But Michael Harper is a guy that I was super excited to see in BYU's defense last year. He had a great start to camp and then suffered just an absolutely devastating knee injury, a second ACL injury opposite the one that he injured as a freshman back at the tail end of 2020 that cost him the 2021 season. Well, ultimately it cost him 2023 and he had, uh, had an opportunity. I, I had an opportunity, I should say, to sit down with him to talk a little bit about his return from injury, where he thinks he fits best in BYU's defense under Jay Hill, and ultimately what his BYU experience has been like to this points so without further ado here you go michael harper talking with myself right here on locked on cougars first wanted to ask you how's your knee doing overall how do you feel like you're physically right now man my knee's doing really good right now you know i'm happy where i'm at six months post-op um i'm moving good laterally i got my full speed going forward back pedals looking good so i'm happy where i'm at how difficult was this injury recovery versus the first one you underwent uh, this one was was definitely difficult in the sense that like I came off a really good season the, pr the prior year mm -hmm. and uh, I had a lot of hopes to repeat that same success as well and uh, so I think it was definitely difficult especially being in the first time being in the Big 12 you know mm -hmm. I wanted to play against Texas and Oklahoma so I missed on that opportunity but uh, I think it's all a part of God's plan you know this year I get a you know playing the Big 12 one more one more season I got to play against Arizona State you know I go to Go back to Tempe where my, you know, where my family lives, get to play Arizona here. So, you know, I'm happy. Were, were you able to kind of use some of the past, like your experience of pre recovering previously to help you kind of accelerate this recovery process at all? Yeah, I would say so for sure. Um, just being through the process before, it helped me a lot. Just knowing what I had to do to, you know, get my mind right, you know, get my body right to where I need to be. And just getting back mentally and physically where I feel like I'm, I'm confident to be back playing again. Now, a lot of guys would have told me, just talking about Jay Hill as a defensive coordinator, that, that it took some time to adapt to what he was running on the scheme. you got to sit on the sideline and kind of watch it all unfold. Do you feel like you're ahead in a way, having it being able to kind of sit back and watch it? Oh, for sure. I mean, there's many days where, I mean, I'm just watching practice with, with Coach Hill, uh -huh. you know, um, picking his brain, really just understanding the whole defense. I think that's a blessing for me as well, just because I am a safety and the defensive coordinator is my yeah. position yeah. coach. So instead of just you know, teaching the back, the back seven or just what the safety's got. We learned the entire defense, so. What's the biggest difference in this defense as a safety versus the previous one in your mind? Um, I'd say just the, uh, you're doing a lot more. Okay. You know, you're reading a lot more. You really got to know what every position on the field is doing because you can be, you know, you got to know, know all of the run keys and all of the pass keys as well because you might be in it. I've talked uh, with Coach Hill and he kind of talked about, there's a clear delineation between strong safety and free safety in this mm -hmm. defense, just the responsibilities. Do you have one that you prefer versus the other? Uh, I definitely prefer strong safety, okay. but I definitely could play free safety as well. I just like strong safety because I like being versatile. So, what, what makes it so versatile? Just the fact that you're playing high, you're playing low, you're playing in the box. Uh, you can be possibly guarding a, a slot receiver. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just... It's just different for, you know, there's just a lot that you can do with it. Does, well, and I know you're a former corner. Does that kind of play to your strengths as a cover guy in your oh, mind? Oh, for sure. I mean, just, you know, be, being able to play corner in the past, you know, safety with mm -hmm. Coach Lamb and Hadley, and now, you know, playing with Jay Hill, it just helps me to be able to, you know, be marketable, mm -hmm. show my talents of, you know, wherever the defense needs my help. What are you hoping to show this spring, if anything at all? Uh, just showing the coaches and, you know, everybody that I'm back, okay. you know, just showing that, you know, I'm confident and I'm not favoring a knee, like, and I, you know, I'm still the, the same one that you saw a couple years ago. 
I, I've talked with people and they say that the, the guys who help with recovery here, like the, the training staff have been very, very good with multiple oh. guys. Can you talk a little bit about what they've done to help you through the process? Oh yeah, and our, our new staff is, you know, second to none. <laughs> we got, um, we got Skyler, we got Coach Tanner, yeah. you know, we got Kobe and we got a whole new, uh, staff in the in the weight uh training room as well yeah. you know they're really good they're they're all a team as well you know it's not multiple people saying different things everybody got the same you know what i mean plan to get me back to where i need to be and you know all of the players as well now when it comes to the upcoming season you talk about that you're gonna play arizona state and arizona and you're a guy from from arizona how cool was that to know that hey i'm gonna be able to go back to my hometown and ask this and play a game oh it's awesome especially because my mom works on the weekends, so it's, okay. it's kind of hard for her to get out to the games. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, Tempe, Arizona, she she lives right in, or she works in Tempe, so, okay. you know, it's, it's going to be awesome having her at the game. Does that, does that add any, I guess, I don't know, intrigue or, like, extra fire to you knowing that, hey, I'm going to be able to play in front of my hometown fans? Oh, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a hometown <laughs> hero, so, I mean, if I, any, any way I can go back to my home state and, you know, beat my homies so last thing for me how has your BYU experience overall been man I love it here I mean I, I'm so happy with my decision to come here you know I would I would never be somewhere else I'm so happy here about to graduate from the business school soon start my MBA program you know okay. the alumni second to none here education is top-notch I mean you got the, some of the best coaches you know it's really is a family and you know I, I wouldn't rather I wouldn't want to be anywhere else there you have it, Michael Harper talking with myself, and a big thank you to him. You can tell he's absolutely uh, loved his time at BYU, and it's not been easy for him. Think about that. To have two uh, season-ending knee injuries during your time as an athlete, that's a really, really tough thing to endure, but you can tell he's come through it. And the nice part about this, as he mentioned, he's looking forward to playing that strong safety spot for BYU, looking forward to having more of a multifaceted role in this BYU defense. And kind of a funny note, uh, I don't know if you guys could see it overhead. The shadows uh, may not have indicated you're watching this on YouTube, but as I was recording this interview, uh, we happen to be in the firing line of BYU's kickers uh, doing some post-practice kicking. Uh, uh, so Will Farron and uh, the other guys who are BYU's kickers were booting it uh, right over our heads. And there were a couple of times I'm watching a ball kind of sail over my head. And I'm like, please don't bounce back, knock over something here or hit Micah. But uh, kind of the, the 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 rigors and the the challenges of the job that I have as a podcaster and or sports radio uh, uh producer uh getting this audio and video content but it was kind of a just kind of a unique note uh, i wanted to pass along to you guys but all the same big thank you to michael harper and like i said i'm rooting for that young man to break through this year i think he's got the capability of being an impact player for byu's defense once again this fall provided he's back to 100 percent health and uh you can tell that he's been working very very hard at that and it sounds like the byu training staff across the board has been very very good in helping him navigate everything he's going through as well all right uh we will finish up today's edition of the podcast looking at byu basketball they jump back up in the national rankings as we all expected after the back to back wins the upset win at kansas and then uh, coming back uh, to take down tcu at home where did they land in the national rankings what does it mean for them as they head into a big big clash in ames iowa on wednesday night against iowa state we're talking about all that next right here on locked on cougars Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Nissan. Now we talked about Nissan at the start of today's show, but the best part about are you the type of the best part about Nissan is are you the type of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further when it comes to your driving style? Ever wonder what what adventure could be around the next corner for you? Well, our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The best part is they got a 2024 Nissan Rogue as a perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. If you're looking for kind of that ability to go, drive around the city, kind of jet around the city, but all at the same time get out into the open air. If you feel like you need to get away for a little bit. They also have the Nissan Pathfinder with 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing. When Adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there with the answer for you as a consumer. Or if you're looking to go all the way, my friends, it's the 2024 Nissan Armada. It will change what you expect from a full-size SUV with a perfect uh, rugged 4x4 that can see up to 8 in a first-class luxury and style. And like I said, it's a full-size SUV with uh, the ability to tow bigger and explore further. That's in the 2024 Nissan Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure courtesy of our friends over at Nissan. Shop NissanUSA.com. 
Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Want to encourage you if you haven't done so already? Uh, please check out our first ever national sports twenty four seven streaming channel on YouTube. It's now also available on Amazon Fire TV and the Free Fire TV channels app. It's called Locked On Sports Today. It is here for you twenty four seven, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus the national shows covering every league as well. Find Locked On Sports Today wherever you get your uh, wherever you get uh, your podcast on YouTube, but also check it out on the Free Fire TV channels app as well. It's a really 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 fun way uh, to get caught up on the new sports news of the day. And it literally covers everything. That's the best part about it. All right. Before we go on today's show, BYU men's basketball, as you would expect, jumped up in the national rankings once again, checking at number 20 in the AP top 25 poll. Uh, very, very nice place to be for BYU. And funny enough, you look at the teams around them. Gonzaga just in front of them. Utah State, a couple spots behind them. Uh, you've got, uh, that was uh, uh, who else was around there? Um, they also include uh, uh, Utah State. I also was going to mention there was one other team right around them. Oh, St. Mary's was right there as well. That's that's who it was. Uh, but it's kind of funny that BYU is right in that bunch with a bunch of old, familiar names around them. But at the same time, uh, BYU is in a fairly good spot, all things considered, as they head into a matchup against Iowa State. Now, the big uh, question right now for BYU is, are they going to be able to get that top four spot in the Big 12 tournament and get that double bye uh, into Thursday night uh, in the tournament out there in Kansas City? That's the big question that BYU has facing them. The big thing that BYU can do uh, for themselves to use the term to control the controllable is to take care of their matchup against Iowa State. Now, that's much easier said than done. Considering that Iowa State, they are undefeated at home this season. They're 17-0. The Cyclones are now ranked six in the country this week. They moved up two spots in their own right in the national rankings this week. And BYU has the unenviable task of having to go to Ames, Iowa and get that win. Now, BYU does have a win over Iowa State earlier this season. One of the few teams who has beaten Iowa State when they came to Provo, and it didn't uh, come without some controversy. Richie Saunders uh, getting a little bit of a, of a let's say fracas or a little bit of a tiff with some Iowa State players. You can guarantee that Iowa State fans are going to be on top of him in this game. They're going to be on top of BYU overall. It's a fan base that's got a very, very uh, proud tradition out there in Ames, Iowa. But I'm looking forward to this opportunity for BYU. Is it is it a guaranteed win by any means? No, it's not because th- this is a tough place to play. As I mentioned, nobody has gone into Hilton Coliseum and won this season. But BYU has to take uh, some uh, confidence knowing that, hey, we went to a place that literally nobody ever wins. Uh, when they went to Lawrence, it was uh, Bill Self was 313 and 17 all time inside uh, uh, the field house, uh, Fog Allen field house out there in Lawrence uh, when BYU went there. And now he has 18 losses in his run at Kansas at home when BYU pulled off that victory. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that BYU can pull off this victory, but they have to be able to shoot the ball well, and they can't afford, it feels like, in this game more than others because Kansas has lost seven uh, games uh, in conference play, and it's like the first time since the late 80s or whatever it was since they have done that. This is a different style that BYU is going up against when they head to Iowa State. Now, they do have the ability to say that we have beaten Iowa State. We know exactly what they're all about, and BYU's outside shooting, if it travels with them to Ames, Iowa, it's the big, uh, clear uh, advantage that BYU has in this game. Iowa State is a team that very much relies on its athleticism. They want to lock you down defensively, but they do most of their damage in the mid-range and at the rim. They're not a very high-volume three-point shooting team, nor are they a very uh, high uh, percentage uh, three-point shooting team. But BYU has to be able to shoot the ball well. And I know that sounds way too simplistic for BYU, but if you want that double buy, that fourth seed going in uh, to that matchup, out there uh, at, at the Big 12 t- uh, tournament, you got to win. Uh, and the, it's a top 20 showdown. Uh, it's got moved to ESPN too. So it's got a really, really big platform. Seven o'clock, by the way, if those of you uh, looking to watch that, it was originally a six o'clock mountain time tip on ESPN plus, but because of the stakes on this game, the fact that BYU is very much in the mix for a top seed in the big 12 tournament, uh, it got the the elevation uh, to, uh, I guess, flex scheduling, probably the best way to term it uh, to ESPN too. And I'm looking forward to this. I, I think it's a big opportunity. We'll go more in depth on what to expect from Iowa State in tomorrow's podcast. Uh, if I don't, uh, we're still working on the details. I'm hoping to have Connor pay on the podcast either tomorrow or the day after that. So depending on how things shake out, we'll have uh, plenty of coverage for you guys on Iowa State regardless. But it's a big opportunity for the Cougars. I, I, that's the, I guess, the overall uh, theme I'm trying to pass along to you guys. And uh, this is going to be a fun 
fun final week for BYU because there's everything to play for. It's not like BYU is locked into anything. They have every reason to go to Ames, Iowa, and obviously with their home uh, finale, senior uh, night uh, festivities against Oklahoma State. They have absolutely uh, no reason uh, to uh, think that they can take it easy. They've got to put the pedal to the metal and absolutely go out and show what they're capable of. But this is a BYU basketball team that after they uh, beat at, at Kansas at Kansas, Anything, and I mean anything is possible for BYU, and we'll see where it ultimately lands. That There is so much that still is uh, to play for and still is so much to be uh, determined when it comes to the Big 12 tournament, but I like uh, BYU's chances. So uh, huge, huge game, especially considering BYU sitting in that tie for fourth place right now with Texas Tech and Kansas. BYU does have the, the tiebreaker over the Jayhawks, but the Red Raiders have the tiebreaker on BYU. So... So many moving parts, so many things to be determined, and we'll see where it ultimately shakes out. But keep an eye on this. It's a big, big opportunity, and BYU being ranked 20th, it just brings bigger uh, stakes, bigger eyeballs, and just an overall bigger feel to this game as BYU and Iowa State do battle on Wednesday night. All right, enough bloviating for me uh, on today's show, but a big thank you as always for you guys' support of the podcast. I welcome any and all feedback. I truly do. Uh, leave us notes, uh, whether you're watching this on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, away in via social media, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can follow us uh, at Locked On Cougars on all three of those platforms. I am also on Twitter. You can see it if you're watching this on YouTube. You can find me, Jacob C. Hatch is my Twitter or AKA X handle. I still call it Twitter. Uh, X just sounds weird, but nonetheless, appreciate all of your guys' support of the podcast. As always, hope you're on a fantastic Tuesday whenever you hear this. And of course, we'll be back tomorrow with all things BYU sports, football, basketball, and everything in between. And thank you uh, for joining us right here on the Locked On Cougars podcast. <laughs>